invited to children's worship. They're gathering in the narthex of the church right now. Uh, if you would please turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 2. I have an additional announcement to make. Um, you might have noticed in the bulletin, but as of two weeks ago, the Presbytery, a group of churches in our area, got together for our quarterly meeting. And at that Presbytery, it was uh, over unanimous, I would say, uh, that our called pastor, Steve Carter, uh, my friend and my coworker here, was unanimously invited and uh, into the Presbytery and approved and everything went splendidly well. We had a couple of our seminary students there too and it was a great model examination. Everything went very well. And so what does that mean? That means that we get to celebrate. And so March 10th, put the date on your calendar. Guys, if you've been here for a number of years, and some of you have not, but this is a celebration of years of prayer and working and looking, and the Lord has answered our prayer, and he has brought us the right man. So we're thankful for that. Do mark that in your calendar, 6 o'clock on March 10th. And so we are continuing our study this week in the book of James. And so if you have not already turned there, it's James chapter 2. This is a very familiar passage to many of you, and you might know this passage. You might remember it because it, it does bring about some controversy, and it has throughout the history of the church. And some would say that this passage presents a contradiction in the Bible. Hmm. Well, I am here today to tell you and to show you that there is no contradiction. The question is before us, what is genuine faith? You might have asked yourself at some point or another, is my faith real? That's what we're talking about today. That's what James is talking about. I'm going to be reading from chapter 2, verse 14 through verse 26. And Calvary, hear this. This is the very word of God given to us. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray. Most gracious, most kind, most merciful Father, we ask you that you would help us this morning to understand this word, not just intellectually, but with our hearts, with our souls, with our affections. 
we ask that you would impress this upon us, that we may honor you and glorify you, please you, for you are good. And we ask this in Jesus' majestic name. Amen. James tells us, faith apart from works is dead. He makes it very clear. Verse 17, he says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In verse 26, he says it again. Faith apart from works is dead. It's not alive. The, the same word there is the word for corpse. Dead. James is asking the question, and I am asking the question. And this is probably be the most important question as your pastor I will ever ask you. Is your faith dead or is it alive? Now, this may seem contradictory to what you've read or heard in other parts of the Bible. Paul says, for instance, in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, works of the law, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. It may seem contradictory because here in verse 21, James says Abraham was justified by works. He goes on in verse 25 to say that Rahab was justified by works. But there's no contradictory. What is James doing? Many of you probably have known someone, or you maybe are someone, who at some point in your life, you either signed something, you answered yes to some questions, you repeated the words of some prayer, and somebody told you that because you did that, you were a Christian. James is concerned about that, and, and we should be concerned about that. Not that those things are bad in and of themselves. We do them here every week. We call you to do it every day. But the question James is prompting us to ask ourselves, how do I know that I have genuine faith? How do I know that I'm really saved? It's a good question to ask. There is not a contradiction in what James is saying, what Paul is saying, and I can point out many. But just to point out one for now, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes, work out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's the same thing James is talking about. Bottom line, true faith works. Good works are a byproduct of a genuine faith. The works are not what saves you. Works are the evidence of saving faith. They demonstrate faith within you. Hundreds of years ago, a man by the name of Philip Melanchthon, he put it best, when he's trying to consider these texts. He says, we are saved by faith alone, but not by faith which remains alone. We are saved by faith alone, but we are not saved by a faith which remains alone. And James is fleshing this out for us. There is a, a horizontal dimension to how faith works, and there's also a vertical person of God dimension to how faith works. And he goes into this progression of unpacking it for us. And that's the progression that I have on the outline for us this morning. And so the first thing, faith without works benefits no one. Benefits no one. Doesn't benefit anyone else. And it sure won't benefit you. 
Here's the person-to-person the -person dimension of how faith works. What good is it, James says, what good is it if you say that you have faith, but when, look at verse 15, if a brother or sister, not just anyone, a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Now, you can probably think about a time when you were like that. You came across somebody who needed help, and what did you do? Nothing. If you're like me, you can think of a thousand times when you could have done something to help and did nothing. And then when we read this, when we read passages like this, what's that feeling you get? What are you feeling? I'm going to ask you to hold on to that for a moment. Because I'm about to make it a little worse. Jesus himself, our Lord, Matthew 25. He's talking about his return, his final judgment. He comes in and he says, Before him will be gathered all the nations, everyone. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd, a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left. This has no implication about where you're sitting right now, okay? So I'm just putting it out there. To the sheep, he said, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He goes on to tell him, For you fed me, you gave me drink, you welcomed me, you clothed me, and you visited me in prison. And their response was, Jesus, when, when do we do that? And Jesus tells them, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. To the others, he said, depart. Depart from me, you are cursed. Go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Did I just make that feeling worse for you? What is that feeling? Is it conviction? Is it conviction based only out of fear? It's an important question. Is it a conviction only based in fear? You may be thinking, well, I better go grab one of those baby bottles and fill them up and bring them back. Or I got I to gotta give money to the, get the gym. You may be thinking that, and, and there's, there's, again, nothing wrong with that, but something more important that I'm more concerned with. If it's only based in fear, look down at verse 19 of chapter 2. In a moment, I'm going to talk about how the demons are the best seminary students. But for now, look, even the demons believe, and what do they do? They shudder. They fear. If that feeling you have is based only out of fear, you have missed what James is saying and what Jesus is saying. What's the opposite of fear? Love. What else is the opposite? Faith. Any relationship, in our relationship, any relationship based on fear is not a good relationship. 
If your relationship with God is solely based on fear, what's going to happen? You're either going to do, just try to do enough to, to appease something, which won't work, by the way, with God. You're going to hide. Or you're just going to do things outwardly to see, have other people see how you're doing. All of that is a losing strategy. The opposite of that fear comes from a place of, wow, Jesus, look what you, you've done that for me? God gave his, his son for me. He loves me, me? That's the difference. It draws you to him from a place of love. Not fear. It stirs up obedience, good works, from a place of love. It draws your affections to him. It's a realization that in God's sight, in God's sight, all of us, every man, woman, and child, are like the poorly clothed person. Lacking daily food. But God, in his mercy, in his compassion, sent Jesus out of heaven and into earth that he may clothe you, that he may feed you, sustain you. What is it that's sustaining you this morning? The language of clothing and feeding are all over the Bible, right? Um, when you trust him, when you put your faith in him, Christ clothes you with his righteousness. Christ feeds you with his own flesh and blood. It's after receiving and realizing that kind of generosity that our faith does not remain alone. We are moved to clothe and feed others. It benefits others. It benefits us. It benefits us more than it benefits others, by the way. If you haven't experienced that already. It shows us that we know that love. We don't live in fear anymore. We can live in the second point, assurance. Assurance. Faith without works assures no one. It assures no one. What's assurance? Assurance is the, the ability to know that we're saved. To be sure of it. How can we know we are saved? In verse 18, James starts this dialogue between two people. One has faith and the other has works. One with works says, I will show you my faith by my works. What does the other man have to show for it? He knows something. He has knowledge. You can know the Bible cover to cover. You can have all the, the best theology. You can, you can possess, and you should possess accurate theology, but it's, it's insufficient. It's insufficient unless the good theology possesses us. A pastor many years ago, said that the, the demons <laughs> attended the best seminary, the best divinity school there is. They all have the, the head knowledge about God. They believe God. They fear him. They shudder. But they don't belong to him. That's the difference. They don't belong to him. Christ does not belong to them. Genuine faith goes beyond the intellect to the desire, to the heart, to the affections. It affects our attitudes. And then in turn, it also affects our actions. There is an, an inseparable union between faith and works. The object of our faith, Jesus Christ, he saves us by faith alone, but that faith does not remain alone. It, it works, 
He works it out in us. In that working, we, we gain assurance. And so if you say you have faith but not works, James says it benefits no one, it assures no one, and lastly, faith without works justifies no one. Verse 21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac to the altar? Those of you who know your Bibles know this story very well. The story is Abraham, we read it earlier, was willing to go and sacrifice his own son. Do you remember what chapter it was that Abraham was willing to go? When God told him to go, it's chapter 22 of Genesis. Okay, chapter 22 of Genesis. That word justified is a legal term. It means to declare something or someone right or true. And so by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are declared righteous, not by anything that you do, but by what he has done. God declares you righteous. When was it that God declared Abraham righteous? Before Genesis 22 before this episode that James is talking about. Genesis 12, I'll read this to you. I will, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12. And then in Genesis 15, we read, and this is what James is quoting from here too. And he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. God declared him righteous. All this occurred before Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac. And justifying himself, Abraham was, was working out, proving a reality already counted to him. You know, that word to justify can be used both ways. Um, and we do the same thing. Like if you told me today is a, it's a sunny day outside, it is, it's a sunny, and I would say, well, justify that, that, justify that statement. And you would say, well, look, at, look outside the window. It, it's, it's sunny. Oh, okay. And you've justified it. Or you'll take me outside. Look. Okay. That's another way of using that word. What... Did Abraham do when he was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac? He was proving, he was proving, he was confirming his faith, showing his faith in what God had already declared to be true. And yet, what was God doing? <laughs> what was in fact happening was that God was trying to show Abraham something along the way. And he shows us these kinds of things along the way as we are willing to prove and to do what he's asked us to do. He shows up. He confirms things for us as we are working to our faith out. God was actually showing him something. He said, his son, his son whom he loved. He said, no, Abraham, you don't have to put your son to death. That's what I'm going to do for you. Abraham's faith was active. His works were a byproduct of his faith. He, he trusted God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And as a result, he was willing to do whatever God said. Think about it this way. If Abraham had claimed to have faith, and God had clearly told him to do something, but then Abraham said, no, I'm not going to do it. Would it not show that Abraham didn't really trust him? Didn't really have faith to begin with? Genuine faith produces works. Please notice also how James pairs 
Abraham next to Rahab. Try to make that comparison, especially if you're a Jewish person living in the first century. Father Abraham, our patriarch, with who? Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute. Right next to each other. James is trying to show us something. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what you have. Whoever you are, whatever gifts you have been given, in whatever situation the Lord is calling you, he's calling you to exercise, to work out your faith. What has the Lord called you to? How is he calling you to trust him today? Today. Most of the time, it's right in front of us, right? Uh, for, in Rahab's case, uh, the Lord brought it to her. Two men were sent to her. Uh, prior to the men getting there, um, she had heard about where they had come from. She had heard that the Lord had delivered them out of slavery in Egypt, how the Lord had dried up the Red Sea, and had told them that they were going to inherit the land. She came to realize that their God was the God of heaven above and the God of the earth beneath. I invite you to read that. It's Joshua chapter 2. It was at the moment she had a, a, a choice to make. There was a risk involved. It meant leaving something behind. Trusting God. It meant doing something not to, to save herself, but confirming her trust in God. Each and every one of us has a choice to make. We are not saved by that choice. We are saved by faith alone. Christ paid it all. Do you, do you, do you see it? He paid it all. It's paid for. And he, you're not able to save yourself. However, you're not saved by a faith that remains alone. It calls you to follow him. What are the ways that the Lord is asking you to trust him? Just like with Abraham and with Rahab, this is that vertical dimension. He puts something before you. Just like Abraham and Rahab, there's usually a sacrifice involved. There's a risk involved, usually. There's a surrender that takes place. God, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to obey. I'm not sure how it's going to end, but here it is. I give myself to you. I give my family to you. Oftentimes the Lord will use possessions or money or relationships, whatever power we have to challenge us, not to save ourselves. We're not earning anything. We can't. But to show that we know his love for us, that he possesses us, and that we possess him, and he wants what's best for us. And this thing, whatever that thing is, is best for us. And it's surrendering to that. The Lord presents us with opportunities all the time to exercise our faith. Not that we're making ourselves righteous. I have to say this again and again. I want to be so clear. We are exercising the righteousness that has already been counted to us so that God's righteousness will be shown forth. The Lord will bring you to some difficult situation, for instance. 
that you're going to have to walk through. And walking through it would be a reminder that, that there's nothing too difficult. There's a lot of things too difficult for us, but there's nothing too difficult for him. How is the Lord calling you to trust him today? Maybe you're here today and you're realizing that you've never really put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That you've never trusted in the power of the resurrection and it's the same power of the resurrection which turns a dead faith alive. It changed the order of worship this week. In order to give us an extra time before coming to the Lord's table. A time of examination. We typically do this before the sermon. But this text this week has prompted me, and it should prompt you to take a look at our own hearts, all of us. Maybe you're here today, and, and you come to church every week or every so often, and you take communion, for instance, but you haven't been exercising the faith you say you have. Maybe there's something that the Lord has asked you to put down, something that the Lord has asked you to give up, something that the Lord is asking you to do, not that it would save you. You're not earning anything. But it means submitting to his authority over your life. Maybe you're here today and your relationship with him has been based solely out of fear. You've been just doing what you got to do in order to stay out of hell. It ain't working. And you've never really trusted him, but you want to right now. Now is the time. This is the day of salvation. On page six of the bulletin, you have a confession of sin, but take this moment now as individuals will come before the Lord and bring your concerns, your sins, all that is weighing you down before him. Confess your sins to him, all your burdens. We'll do so as individuals first, and then we'll come together as one voice with the words listed on page six. Brothers and sisters, will you join me in those words? O oh Lord, in whose hands are life and death, by whose power I am sustained, and by whose mercy I am spared, look down upon me in pity. Forgive me that I have until now so much neglected the duty which you have assigned to me and suffered the days and hours of which I must account to pass away without any endeavor to accomplish your will. Grant me, therefore, so to repent of my negligence that I may obtain mercy from you and pass the time which you shall yet allow me in diligent performance of your commands. Through Jesus Christ, amen. And to all who truly repent, who know Jesus, who love him, because you know that he loves you, hear this scripture of assurance, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Yeah. And out of that assurance, 